Whether you want to call this connector J3400, NACS, or just the Tesla charge connector, this connector has been generating the most EV news headlines over the last year. Whether it's a story about which car companies are in or out of the Tesla party, Subaru, for instance, recently announced their support for this charge connector, or whether it's talk about which companies are joining Tesla on the supercharger network. Ford has announced that for that Mach-E, they will be providing adapters to customers that already have their Mach-E's so they can charge at Tesla superchargers coming soon. But for me, the most interesting thing about the J3400 standard, now that it is officially done, and most car companies have said they are signed up for that J3400 standard, is not the quick DC fast charging or its interoperability, it's actually this connector's ability to support 277 volt AC level two charging. And that means it's gonna be a lot easier and less expensive for schools, small businesses, apartments, condos, et cetera, to support more EVSEs being installed. Let's talk about why that is, what 277 volt power is. We're gonna nerd out deep into the episode, so if you wanna stay around for all of your questions and answers on three-phase power, 277 volt charging, and why I think this is the biggest news for this connector coming soon, stay around to the end of the video. I'll also talk about why we're seeing J3400 to CCS DC fast charge adapters from companies like Ford and GM, but so far no manufacturer has announced support for a J3400 to J1772 adapter, right like this Tesla tap. But before we get to that, let's talk about power. In North American homes, we have two standard voltages, 120 volts for small appliances like your computer or your toaster or your blender, these devices plug into the wall via either a 15 amp or a 20 amp plug. They look pretty similar, except that on the 15 amp plug, both of the prongs are vertical, and on the 20 amp plug, one's horizontal. In North America, 240 volt power is typically reserved for larger draw appliances. So think electric oven, electric clothes dryer, or electric vehicle right like this one. And in case you're wondering, this is what the plug on the typical level 2 EVSE looks like. This one is a 14-50. Okay, so that's 120 volts and that's 240 volts there's just one problem. In this office complex, 240 volts does not exist. And that's the case for most commercial and light industrial properties around the US, from the average movie theater to a strip mall to your local grocery store, churches, even larger apartment buildings, etc. because these businesses are delivered 480 volt three phase power from the utility, which means you have 480 volts or 277 volts available without using a transformer. And then on the inside of the building, we have a transformer to step things down to 120 volts or 208 volts. So four different voltages to choose from, but none of them are 240. If you've made it this far in the video, congratulations for being a power nerd like me. Now let's take a deeper dive into 277 volt charging and why it is so incredibly important. But before we get specifically to that, we need to talk about how power happens at home. And this is where some people get confused because at home we have 120 volt or 240 volt power. Pardon my penmanship here. The important thing to remember about this is that this is one phase power and this is single split phase. Here's how it works. The power comes in from the utility and we have one winding on a transformer. Sorry, my uh, bad drawing skills here. This is a transformer. And the power coming in from the utility could be at a wide variety of different voltages. We'll just say 5,000 volts over here on the input side. Then there's gonna be a transformer somewhere, you know, on a pole or underground, wherever it is for your particular living situation. And then we have another coil over here. This is how we get 240 volts. But what's interesting about the way power is delivered in North America is that by and large, residential installations have single split phase. In fact, in a decent number of areas in the United States, it is not legal to supply a residence with three phase power. And here's how you get 120 volts. They have a center tap on the transformer. This is really a novel thing. So from one side of the transformer to the other, we get 240 volts, right like that. But between neutral, and line one, we'll call that line one and that line two, between these two areas over here is where we get 120 volts, 120 over there as well. Here's what single split phase power looks like in reference to ground. That's that purple line I just drew there. Remember that in North America, ground and neutral are tied together. So whether we're talking about line one or line two of your household electrical service, 
to ground, this is always going to be 120 volts right there. Whether we're talking about that or we're talking about right over there, that's always 120. But what happens if you connect line one and line two together? You get access to 240 volts. Split phase electrical services are the novel answer to needing more power for higher draw devices like electric vehicles, but wanting the safety of having a lower potential to ground. So no matter what you do, whether you're taking a look at that peak there or that peak there or any of those peaks anywhere on this chart, touching one of those lines, sticking your foot in a puddle, all you're going to get is 120 volts. Electrical delivery for the average commercial customer, industrial customer, and larger apartment buildings is very different. In these situations, the utility delivers power at 480 volts. This is actually the electrical panel in the back of this building. Pardon the image here. There's a lot of construction going on back there. I could not actually get a video camera back there right now, and that's why it looks so messy. So 480 volts is being delivered there. That's the main electrical panel on our end. The meter and the main disconnect, they're somewhere else. It's a 225 amp, 480 volt service. It's a relatively hefty one. But not a lot runs off of this 480 volt panel. It's basically the lights in the building. Yes, the lights in the building and the big air conditioning compressor up on the roof. Also, there's a six horsepower air compressor that's over there on that side. That's why there's that big air tank there. That all runs off of 480 volts. Everything else that goes through to this big transformer down there. And then we are responsible as the electrical customer. That's actually our transformer. We're responsible for creating whatever power voltages we need off of that 480 volt three phase service. And the three phase part is critical from that transformer. It then goes up to this disconnect box and then it goes into this 208 volt three phase. Pardon me. I can't type there. Three phase breaker panel. And then all the loads come off of there. I don't want to get too far off in the weeds here, but this is what the waveform of single phase power looks like. This is what the waveform of three phase power looks like. And yes, it is single phase still, even though it looks like that. And it kind of looks like the sort of DNA strands right in front of you. And that's because the different phasors of single split phase power don't relate to a rotating magnetic electric field. That's why it's not two phase power. I get asked about that now and then. That's why it's not two phase power. It's why it's single phase. Key thing to know about three phase power here is where these lines line up. If I were to draw that same fictitious reference line there to ground across this waveform, and then we start attacking these individual peaks, something relatively interesting happens. So over here, we get 120 volts. That is the same power that you'd get at home. But no matter how you try and slice it peak to peak, you're never going to get more than 208 volts out of 120, 208, three phase power. And that's because unlike single phase power, where these waveforms are diverging, sort of like two dolphins doing symmetrical diving or something like that, in three phase power, they're offset slightly. So the peaks don't happen at the same time. Now, what about the power that's happening before the transformer? Well, as I said, that's 480 volt three phase. And here's how that goes down. The potential across here or right there, that is 480 volts. Again, if I can spell there and neutral to any of these lines, that is 277 volts. That's where that number comes from. And this is where rubber really hits the road. In order to supply level two charging to my employees, currently I have to put the EV is over here on the 208 volt panel. That means that that power has to go through that transformer in order to get to the vehicle. And this transformer does exact an efficiency toll about 2% for this particular transformer. But there's another reality. This particular transformer is only rated for about 75 kilowatts. That may sound like an awful lot, but it's nothing compared to the main 480 volt service entrance to the building. If I simply did nothing other than charge electric vehicles off of this electrical setup, I could support twice as many EVs before the transformer as I could after this specific transformer. Obviously I could get a bigger transformer or I could get another transformer, but 
there's cost. There's space involved with that. Not only do you have to buy it, you have to put it in there. As you can see, that's a pretty decently sized transformer physically. It's kind of a pain in the butt to work with. You have the efficiency losses, etc. It would be just so much easier to charge an EV right off that 480 volt panel. There are also a ton of available breakers in that panel. If you've ever thought to yourself, gee, it seems like my EV charges slower at the office. You're not crazy. You're not seeing things. It is indeed charging slower. And that's because the onboard charger in most EVs is current limited, and it doesn't change that current limit based on the voltage you give it. Say, for instance, a Tesla Model Y, its onboard charger maxes out at 48 amps. 48 amps, 240 volts is 11 and a half kilowatts. But 48 amps at 208 volts, that's rather sadly only 9.9 .9 kilowatts. It's going to take longer to charge your battery. But if you plug that Model Y into 277 volt power, it will actually suck down 13.3 kilowatts and make that charging notably quicker. The future is a little bit uncertain for vehicles with J1772 ports on board. Could they be adapted to support 277 volt charging? We just don't know the answer to that. It's entirely possible that some vehicles could get a simple software update. Maybe they could limit the current on 277 volts and therefore they would be just fine. Others may require hardware updates to properly support 277 volt charging. And I suspect it is going to start coming in reasonable numbers because it's fully supported by the new standard and is going to make charging installation a lot easier and cheaper for a wide variety of businesses, non nonprofits, educational institutions, etc. I haven't been able to get any car makers to comment on this directly, but I suspect that the higher voltage charging, which is fully baked into the J3400 charging standard, is the reason that it's taking a while to get new charge ports on electric vehicles, because it's not simply a matter of putting a new port on the vehicle. Clearly, Tesla has proved that they can build millions of these ports a year. It wouldn't be that hard to just bump up the production to whoever needed one but it is going to be a much bigger deal to redesign those onboard chargers to support the higher voltage charging. The last thing I should address is three phase AC level two charging. This is a question I get asked a great deal from especially our European viewers that are confused why we don't have three phase level two charging in the United States. The main answer again is because you don't find three phase power at home. So why design your electric vehicle to charge off of three phase power when it doesn't have access to three phase power, except if it's maybe at the office or at the mall? Sure, you could do that. but the vast majority of charging happens at home. So that's just extra cost, extra waste, extra pins on a connector that you wouldn't normally be using. However, things are very different in Europe. Not only is three phase power everywhere, in a lot of areas of Europe, you have to have balanced loads on each of the three phases. And that's why they have certain restrictions around EV charging. If you plug a single phase charger into an electrical outlet, say in Germany, 4.6 kilowatts is the most you can draw on a single phase. But generally speaking, other areas of Europe limit that down to 3.5 to 3.6 kilowatts. So in practice, most EVs in Europe with single phase chargers will top out under four kilowatts as far as its ability to charge on a single phase. That wouldn't really work so well in the United States because you want to be able to charge at 11 or 12 or 19 kilowatts off of single phase AC power. And that's the reality here. It's just a reality that's different elsewhere. And that's part of why they have the chunkier cables in Europe. In fact, actually, the connector ends are bigger than this J1772 connector because it has to have some additional pins in there for three phase AC level two charging. But that's why you're never going to see this outside of the United States, most likely Canada and Mexico, because outside of these single split phase countries, this connector just doesn't make an awful lot of sense. Let me know what you think about that deep dive down there in the comment section. Was this too deep? Uh, let me know down there and let me know what other topics we should take a deeper dive into. See all of you next week.